Uh, our first speaker is Peter Howley. I'm not, I'm not gonna detail everybody's background because uh, the backgrounds are actually put in the, uh, in the program, but Peter Howley's from Harvard Medical School and he's gonna talk about papillomaviruses and human cancer. Peter. Uh, thank you, Arnie. It's a, it's a real privilege to be here. I want to thank Arnie and Bob for the uh, invitation to uh, speak today. Uh, I'll be speaking mainly about the uh, papillomaviruses and, and uh, human cancer. And I decided to give a little bit of an introduction to uh, viral oncology and uh, viruses in human cancer. Actually, the field of viral oncology goes back um, approximately 100 years uh, when the first discovery of viruses that were associated with cancer, these were done in birds. Uh, where they were the avian leukosis virus and the, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, Rouse uh, sarcoma virus. Uh, this work, uh, Peyton Rouse eventually received the Nobel Prize for. Um, nearly 50 years after the um, discovery. Uh, this initial discovery actually didn't have much of an impact, uh, and the notion of viruses and cancer really didn't take hold until uh, the discovery of virus, mammalian viruses uh, in cancer, um, and that was in the 1930s. The work of uh, Richard Shope to, at the Rockefeller University together with Peyton Rouse, uh, Shope described the first uh, uh, described the first um, uh, papillomavirus in cottontail rabbits, and the work of Shope and Rouse together showed that this virus, the papillomavirus, could be associated with naturally occurring cancers and experimentally induced cancers uh, in the rabbit. Uh, the experimentally, however, uh, working with tumor viruses took a major step forward in the 1950s when uh, Ludwig Gross discovered viruses in mice that one could experimentally study. Um, uh, 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 and uh, this, this initial, the initial viruses were uh, retroviruses. Uh, the subsequent uh, viruses uh, by uh, Eddie and Stewart were the uh, murine polyomaviruses, small uh, DNA viruses. In the 1960s, uh, SV40 was discovered. This was discovered as a, uh, a contaminant in poliovirus uh, vaccines. Uh, and this was a, 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 a primate virus, so there, it, and it was shown that it could induce uh, tumors in hamsters. So the notion of such viruses occurring uh, in uh, primates uh, took hold. Now, what's been very important in the tumor virus field has been the models uh, to study a cancer progression, and uh, for these, a number of very common human and, uh, and primate viruses, including the adenoviruses and the polyomaviruses that are tumorigenic in rodents, have uh, uh, been extremely useful in the identification of the pathways and the genes that are associated in uh, cancers. Now, with regard to viruses in human cancer, uh, 1964 really marks the starting point of active research with human cancer viruses, uh, with um, Tony Epstein's discovery of herpes-like uh, particles in uh, human lymphoblasts uh, derived from Burkitt's lymphomas. Uh, this was the discovery of the Epstein-Barr virus, and we'll be hearing more about that from Bill Sugden today. Um, in the, during the 1970s, evidence accumulated for the role of hepatitis B virus in primary hepatocellular carcinomas in humans. Uh, and at the time, it was realized there were infectious agents that were not hepatitis B virus that were also associated with cancer. Uh, and this eventually led to the identification of a hepatitis C virus. And we'll be hearing uh, uh, about the, um, uh, th these uh, viruses associated with um, uh, liver cancer today. The first interest in the human papillomaviruses in cancer uh, came from uh, work um, uh, in skin cancers, the work of Gerard Orth and uh, Stefania Jablanska in the 1970s. Uh, soon after that, uh, interest uh, came about for uh, the possibility of cervical cancer. 
uh, and it was in uh, 1983 and 1984 that Harold Zurhausen uh, first discovered HPV-16 and HPV-18, which are uh, associated with 70% of human cervical cancer, and this was the work uh, that he received the Nobel Prize for uh, last fall. I should point out that in 1980, HTLV-1, a retrovirus, was discovered by Bob Gallo's group and subsequently linked to adult T-cell um, leukemia. We'll be hearing about this virus from, um, uh, from uh, Arnold Rabson today. Uh, people are still looking for viruses, and uh, uh, Ewan Chang, who will be speaking today, uh, she, uh, he, uh, she and uh, Patrick Moore uh, discovered in 1994 the, uh, a virus associated with the Kaposi's sarcoma herpes virus, uh, uh, Kaposi's sarcomas, this is a herpes virus, and we'll be hearing from Don Ganim about that today. And Yuan Chang and Patrick Moore uh, just last year discovered a new uh, candidate tumor virus, uh, a human polyoma virus in Merkel cell uh, skin cancers, and we'll be hearing about that again also later today. So. The opportunity, as Arnie had mentioned, the linkage of a virus to cancer really provides wonderful opportunities. The opportunities of preventing the infections and therefore preventing the lesions that pre uh, can potentially uh, uh, go on to develop into cancers. Uh, it also has the, and that's where the major advances have been made for hepatitis B and the human papillomaviruses. But there are also possibilities for therapeutic vaccine strategies, and a number of uh, biotech companies and pharmaceutical companies are looking into uh, the possibility of therapeutic strategies. In addition is the possibility of uh, small molecule antiviral uh, therapeutic strategies, again, uh, on, on going on mainly in the academic uh, community at this point. So with regard to the human papillomaviruses and the papillomaviruses in general, uh, the, uh, there are now recognized to be over a hundred different human papillomaviruses, and these tend to be associated with specific uh, clinical entities. Important in the field have also been some of the animal viruses, such as the bovine papillomavirus and the uh, cottontail rabbit papillomavirus, which have been wonderful models for uh, studying the molecular biology uh, and um, virus host cell interactions for this group of viruses. Now, with regards to the papillomaviruses, uh, these are small DNA viruses. Uh, they're non-enveloped. Uh, they have small double-stranded circular genomes of about 8,000 base pairs. They encode between eight and 10 genes, depending upon the virus one looks at. Uh, the papillomaviruses have a very specific tropism for squamous epithelial cells, and they infect the basal uh, uh, cell layer to establish uh, an infection. The life cycle of the virus is intimately associated with the uh, differentiation program of the squamous um, uh, cell. And this is a uh, section of a um, mucosal epithelium from the cervix. Uh, and uh, it's normal, uh, this is not an in, uh, infected lesion, but if it were infected, the virus replication and the uh, production of virus particles only occurs in the more terminally differentiated uh, cells. So as I mentioned before, uh, the papillomaviruses really uh, were first recognized in the early uh, 1930s from the work of uh, Richard Shope, uh, and he and Rouse went on to show that lesions like this uh, could progress onto cancer, and that the virus that they were able to isolate from these cutaneous horns or cutaneous papillomas uh, when inoculated into uh, domestic rabbits uh, could induce lesions which uh, could also progress to cancer. So, the notion that the papillomaviruses were associated with cancers really dates back to the, um, uh, to the 1930s. Um, with regard HPV in human cervical cancers, um, the, I'm sorry, this didn't, uh, there, there, it got a little bit messed up in the, um, uh, uh, in uh, getting uploaded. Um, the etiologic uh, evidence implicating a very nearly transmitted agent 
uh, in uh, cervical cancer actually dates back to the mid-19th century. Uh, anecdotal uh, but published uh, um, uh, studies uh, implicating a venereally transmitted agent in cervical cancer. Basically studies which showed that uh, cervical cancer was rare in nuns and uh, more often seen in um, uh, prostitutes. Uh, led physicians to speculate that there was a venereally transmitted agent associated with cervical cancer. Uh, the cytologic and virologic evidence suggesting um, uh, that it was uh, possibly a papillomavirus was uh, developed in the 1970s. And as I've mentioned, the discovery of HPV-16 and HPV-18 by Harold Zurhausen uh, in 1983 and 1984 uh, was the basis of uh, his Nobel Prize uh, this past year. Uh, the identification of E6 and E7 as the oncogenes and the establishment of, thank you, uh, of the mechanisms by which they contribute to carcinogenesis occurred in the uh, late 1980s uh, into the 90s and continues even today. I'll talk a little bit about E6 and E7 in a, sev in a second. And the development of the VLP-based uh, ba vaccines, which we'll be hearing more from Adele um, uh, Mahmoud, uh, it occurred in the um, uh, mid-1990s. Uh, this led to the FDA approval uh, uh, in 2006 of Gardasil by Merck uh, and a, uh, a, um, a, a second VLP, which is approved in the United States. A second a VLP based vaccine, but not yet approved by the FDA, has been developed by GSK, but is uh, used in many other, uh, many other countries. So with regard to the papillomaviruses, uh, the, um, the, this is uh, the phylogenetic tree of the papillomaviruses based on the sequence of the papillomaviruses. Uh, and human papillomaviruses can be found in four different arms, in the, uh, the uh, genus alpha, the genus beta, the genus gamma, and the genus uh, mu. Um, of these, uh, the way uh, this phylogenetic tree is put together, the genuses are here on the outside, and then each of the genuses then are further broken down into species. So this cluster here, for instance, is uh, species three, and then the individual types are, are shown here. Uh, and the um, uh, length of the, uh, of, of, of the lines and the distance between the points in the lines determines how distinct some of these uh, viruses are. Now, if one uh, takes a further look at uh, the, uh, the HPVs that are associated with um, uh, genital tract lesions, approximately 20 or 25 of the HPVs that have human papillomaviruses that have been described are associated with genital tract lesions. And these are further divided on the basis of their biological activity into what's called the low-risk group and the high-risk group. The low-risk group are those viruses that are associated with venereal warts or condyloma cuminata that rarely progress onto a cancer or are rarely associated with cancer. In contrast, the high-risk group, which include HPV 16 and 18, the initial ones discovered by Harold Zurhausen, and a whole host of 13, a total group of 13 or 14, are what are associated with uh, cervical, um, uh, cervical cancer and other anogenital cancers, penile carcinoma, some vulvar carcinomas, uh, perianal carcinomas, et cetera. Um, uh, and uh, the, uh, again, HPV 16 and 18 we'll be hearing more about uh, because these are the two high-risk HPVs that are included in the uh, Merck vaccine. Um, if one takes a look on the phylogenetic tree of where these uh, high-risk HPVs map, uh, they map into species 7 and species 9 of the uh, genus alpha HPV. So I've highlighted HPV 18 over here and uh, HPV 16 over here. So these are the two groups uh, or the two species of viruses that are associated with the anogenital cancers. Now I mentioned at the beginning, however, that the first evidence that a papillomavirus was associated with human cancers actually came from the work of Gerard Orth and Stefania Jablonska who showed a link or an association of specific HPVs with non-melanoma skin cancers. Um, uh, this, I'm sorry, this actually shows where the low-risk HPVs map. They're in species uh, 10, associated with genital tract lesions. 
um, but not the high risk for um, malignant progression. And the uh, cutaneous HPVs that are associated with non-melanoma skin cancers are these beta HPVs over here. I've highlighted HPV 5, 8, and 17. These were the original isolates of Gerard Orth and Stefania Jablonska, shown to be present in the skin cancers of patients with epidermodysplasia verruciformis. But these are also the HPVs that are found in the skin, associated with the skin cancers, often in immunosuppressed individuals. Now, the mechanisms by which these beta viruses are associated with cancer has really not yet been uh, worked out or studied well. So if we look then, uh, come back to the genus alpha and those that are associated with the human uh, cervical cancer, the DNA of a high-risk HPV is found in over 95% uh, of human cervical cancers. Carcinogenic progression of an HPV um, positive Premalignant lesion is often associated with the integration of the viral DNA into the host cell. So it's not part of the normal infection. Uh, and these integrated HPVs um, uh, are invariably transcriptionally active. And the two genes, the two viral oncogenes that are always expressed in HPV positive cancers are E6 and E7. Shown here is the circular uh, a map of a, a circular uh, a genome for of the HPVs. Again, I mentioned that there are about 8,000 base pairs in size. Uh, the E6 and E7 genes are the viral oncoproteins. These are the genes that are always expressed in cervical cancer. I'll talk about them in a second. I'm going to highlight E2 because I'll talk about that at the, uh, at the end of my talk. E2 is an important regulatory protein for the papillomaviruses. It's involved in viral DNA replication because it helps to recruit the E1 helicase to the origin of replication to initiate viral DNA replication. Uh, E2 is also important as a transcription factor. And for the Viruses that are associated with cervical cancer, E2 serves as a repressor of the viral oncoproteins. Uh, the importance of this is, uh, again, the issue of the viral DNA integration that one sees in, uh, often sees in cancers. What one generally sees is that the integration has occurred in a manner to knock out expression of the E2 gene. And in fact, there's, it's very, very rare to find any evidence of expression of the E2 gene in any um, cervical cancers. So uh, for instance, this is the integrated copy, single copy of HPV16 that's present in the CIHA cervical carcinoma cell line. It's transcriptionally active. Uh, it's been integrated into chromosome 14 in a manner that disrupts E2, and the expression, therefore, of E6 and E7 is dysregulated within these cells. So let me then talk about E6 and E7 before getting back to E2. Um, E6 and E7 are small genes. They encode small proteins, and all of the activities that have been associated with E6 and E7 are by virtue of the proteins with which they interact. Uh, and it was back in the early 1990s uh, that, um, uh, that our group and other groups showed that E6 and E7 functioned in ways that were very similar to the way that the tumor antigens for SV40 and the adenoviruses function. And that is, by, in the case of E7, by targeting the retinoblastoma protein, a tumor suppressor gene protein, and related pocket proteins called P107 and P130. And E6, in work that I did in collaboration with Arnie Levine, targets P53 in an analogous manner to adenovirus E1b, um, the 55 kilodalton uh, version of E1b, or the carboxy terminus of SV40 large T antigen. But in doing so, it does so in a, a slightly different manner. It doesn't bind directly to P53. Instead, it, um, it uh, utilizes a cellular uh, protein called the E6-associated protein uh, to form a complex uh, with P53. So one of the questions is why, 
of these papillomaviruses targeted uh, these, um, uh, these tumor suppressor pathways, the RB pathway and the um, uh, P53 pathway? The answer is basically to replicate their viral DNA. The interaction of uh, these uh, viral, on the viral oncoproteins uh, with, uh, uh, with RB, for instance, uh, turns on uh, the genes that are required for uh, uh, viral DNA uh, replication. Um, RB, as you many of you probably know, is a protein that's involving, uh, involved in gating progression through the cell cycle. Uh, RB binds e the E2F family of transcription factors and in doing so uh, represses the activity of E2F. RB is normally regulated by cyclin-dependent kinases, and when phosphorylated, RB releases E2F. E2F is then a transcription factor that turns on the cellular genes that are required for a DNA replication. Uh, what E7 does uh, in binding RB is compete off the binding of E2F and actually targets RB for uh, degradation. Uh, and in doing so, the expression of E7 by itself will drive the cell uh, in, in, into, the, uh, into the cell cycle. Uh, the purpose of this is to turn on the DNA replication machinery in cells that have otherwise exited the cell cycle. So this is a, a section of a squamous epithelium. Uh, normally, the only cells that can divide in a squamous epithelium are the basal cells. Once a squamous epithelial cell becomes a supra-basal cell, it exits the cell cycle. I mentioned before, however, that the replication of the viral DNA and the assembly of the virus particles occurs only in the more terminally differentiated cells. So the papillomaviruses have had to devise a mechanism to turn on the DNA replication in otherwise post-mitotic cells, and they do so through the E7 uh, protein. Uh, but E7 has additional um, uh, cellular targets than PRB, and perhaps one of the more interesting ones is that it can uh, cause uh, abnormal uh, replication of the uh, centrosomes, and in doing so can contribute to um, uh, aneuploidy. This is the work of Stefan Dunzing uh, and Carl Munger. Uh, what about E6? What does E6 do? Well, as I've mentioned before, what it does is target P53. And it does so by uh, commandeering a cellular protein, the E6-associated protein, and bringing it to P53. E6AP is a ubiquitin protein ligase. So what E6 is actually doing is directing the proteolysis or ubiquitilation of P53 uh, by um, directing E6AP uh, to P53. Uh, why care about P53? Um, uh, hard to tell, talk about P53 here in Princeton, uh, but uh, P53, I think, as everyone knows, is uh, normally maintained at very low levels in response to a variety of, uh, uh, of genotoxic stress signals. Uh, the levels of P53 go uh, up uh, within cells. E7 expression itself is a genotoxic stress, so E7 is sufficient to increase the levels of P53. This, this is uh, mechanisms that are involving uh, the, the stability of P53 and also the translation of P53. Uh, P53 uh, can, uh, it can induce uh, the expression, it's a transcription factor that will induce the expression of genes that are involved in cell cycle arrest or uh, pro-apoptotic. And the consequence of that uh, then is uh, would block uh, DNA replication. Uh, so what E6 does uh, is by targeting P53 levels is block the ability of e P53 to function uh, as a uh, transcription factor and increase the level of these factors that would uh, otherwise inhibit um, a viral DNA replication. But E6 has other targets, uh, and our laboratory and other uh, uh, laboratories have been studying E6 uh, for a number of years in terms of these other targets. Um, I highlight here a number of the targets uh, that have been uh, reported in the literature, and I put in the outside, uh, in, uh, outside the boxes, activities that have been ascribed uh, to P53. 
uh, the activity that Arnie Levine's laboratory and our laboratory worked out together is that E6 uh, causes the degradation of P53 uh, through the E6-associated protein. Um, there are other activities here that are uh, particularly interesting. One is the fact that E6 uh, can immortalize cells, and, and it does so uh, at least in part through the activation of the cellular telomerase at a uh, transcription level. This is the work of um, of uh, Denise Galloway and uh, Richard Schlegel. Uh, and the mechanism by which it activates the telomerase is not yet clear. Uh, both MYC and a, a transcriptional repressor protein have been implicated in this, but that pathway uh, hasn't uh, yet really been um, uh, totally worked out. But the key of all of this is that the dysregulated expression of E6 and E7 is a key step uh, associated with HPV uh, carcinogenesis in initiating and allowing genomic instability that in turn can lead to the accumulation of cellular mutations that ultimately can result in cancer. The point is that most HPV infections don't result in cancer. Cancer is a rare outcome of these HPV infections, and it's uh, estimated that a woman who's infected by one of these high-risk HPVs has about a 1 in 30 lifetime risk of developing cancer. So other events have to occur, other genetic events have to occur, and what E6 and E7 essentially do is set the table to, um, uh, uh, for these other genetic events uh, to occur. Let me turn now to E2 and talk a little bit about some more recent data in the, in the laboratory. I mentioned er earlier that it's a regulatory protein encoded by these viruses. It's not expressed in the cancers. Uh, it's involved in viral DNA replication. It's involved in viral transcription. It's also involved in plasmid maintenance, and this is uh, the, the recent work that got us into um, uh, thinking more about E2 recently. Um, the uh, papillomavirus E2 protein uh, uh, looks like a may, maybe a standard transcription factor. It has a at its carboxy terminus a DNA binding dimerization domain. Uh, uh, E2 is highly conserved among all of the papillomaviruses, and its functions appear to be conserved among the papillomaviruses. Uh, the carboxy terminus and the amino terminus are conserved regions. In the middle is a region that varies from virus to virus or type to type in terms of the size and, uh, and amino acid composition, and it's referred to as the hinge region. Uh, and at the amino terminus is the region that uh, really carries out much of the work of E2. Uh, it's required for the replication, and that's because it's the part that binds the E1 protein of the virus. It's uh, involved in transcriptional functions, including transcriptional activation and transcriptional repression. And it's also required for the virus to um, uh, maintain the genomes within infected cells. Uh, so one of the tricks that the papillomaviruses have had to learn to do is how to keep a plasmid DNA within a, within a dividing cell. And the way it does so is by associating the viral DNA with the mitotic chromosomes during mitosis to ensure that the viral DNA is included um, uh, uh, when the, when in the, in the uh, nucleus when the nuclear, uh, when the nuclear membrane reforms. So back in uh, 2004, we identified a cellular factor. We were interested in what protein was responsible for this mitotic tethering of the viral DNA to uh, the host chromosomes. E2 is involved, and we identified the cellular protein BRD4 as being uh, a, the uh, protein that actually mediated this within bovine papillomavirus infected cells and appears to play a role in some of the HPVs uh, 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 also in tethering this uh, gene. Um, uh, but we were been more interested recently in the question of the E2-mediated transcriptional repression. Uh, as I mentioned, the E2 for the uh, HPVs associated with cervical cancer, E2 represses the promoter that drives the E6 and E7 genes. So E6 can E2 can repress the viral oncoprotein uh, E6 and E7. In cancers, the HPV genome is usually integrated with disruption of E2. I've mentioned that. Uh, work from uh, initially from Moshe Yanif's laboratory, more recently from Dan DeMaio's laboratory, has shown that re-expression of E2 in HPV-positive cancer cells, such as HeLa cells, represses E6 and E7 uh, and causes a cell cycle arrest. 
the loss of E2 resulting in the activation of E6 and E7 is believed to be an important step uh, associated with uh, uh, carcinogenesis. So we were interested in identifying the genes that were mediating this E2 repression function. Uh, this just schematically uh, shows the uh, E6 and E7 uh, within a, a cervical cancer cell. Uh, it's not repressed. It's making E6 and E7. RB and P53 are uh, being uh, uh, um, uh, targeted for inactivation and degradation. Um, when one adds E2 to the cells, uh, you uh, basically uh, target, uh, you turn off the expression of the uh, promoter, uh, E6 and E7 levels go down, RB and P53 levels go up, and one gets a cell uh, cycle arrest and senescence. So the question is what genes were involved in the E2-mediated repression function? The way we approach this, this is the work of Jen Smith in the laboratory, was to do a, um, uh, a whole genome siRNA screen uh, to identify uh, which of these genes were involved, which cellular genes were involved. Now, with regard to E2-mediated repression, there have been two models that are out there. One model that was uh, favored in the 1990s was basically steric hindrance. Uh, shown here is the uh, long control region, a region that's uh, upstream of the E6 and E7 uh, genes, uh, and shown are some of the transcription factors uh, that bind there, and these are the location of the E2, um, uh, E2 genes there. Uh, the model that was favored in the uh, in 1990s and, and up to a couple of years ago uh, was that E2 in binding to those sites block the uh, ability of other transcription factors uh, such as SP1 or uh, Tata binding protein uh, to engage uh, the promoter. However, th this model could not be entirely correct. And the reason for that is if one took the DNA binding domain of E2 by itself, that did not um, uh, basically uh, uh, cause this repression. So just engaging these sites was not sufficient. And secondly, one could make specific amino acid changes within the E2 transactivation domain that also knocked out this function. This really argued that there's specific transcription factors or factors within the cell with which E2 is interacting that are required for um, this transcriptional um, repression function. So we're interested in finding out what these might be and wanted to uh, basically do an unbiased screen to identify them. So what we did was generate a cell line first to do this screen in. It's a cell line that we constitutively expressed E2 in. The first E2 we worked with was the bovine papillomavirus E2, but as you'll see in a secondary screen, we come in with HBV16 E2 to uh, do some validation. Um, the way we generated it was to uh, uh, have the E2 tag so we could measure E2 levels, uh, and we hooked it up with an iris to uh, the IL-2 receptor. Now, the reason for this initially was to select the cells that contained E2, but this turns out to be an important control uh, in our uh, screen because the messenger RNA that's making E2 also has in it the IL-2 receptor gene. Um, the second thing we did, so we took this cell line, we established a single ce uh, uh, a, a cell line with this, and then in in uh, uh, introduced into it uh, the HPV-18 LCR driving luciferase. Um, that took single cell clones and identified single cell clones that behaved well. And but by he behaved well, I mean is they have measurable but low levels of luciferase coming off of this. And that when one puts an siRNA to knock out E2 expression, it basically turns on high levels of luciferase. So these are two siRNAs to E2. You can see we can easily knock out E2 expression, and the consequence is a robust turning on of the luf luciferase gene. So the screen we did basically was to look for siRNAs to genes that would turn on luciferase. Um, uh, and, and the way we did it was using the Dharmacon smart, cool, smart pool SIRNA, uh, SIRNA library 
did it in triplicate, used a reverse transfection technique, uh, and then uh, determined the um, hit uh, by a z-score, the relative luciferase, and again, it's all done in triplicate. Uh, so these are actually um, images of the plates. Uh, uh, this is the sRNA2E2. You can see it's turning things on. You can see some things are turning them off, some things are turning it slightly on. Uh, and then when one looks at the, all, all of the uh, human genes, the 21,000 genes, you can see that uh, most, of the, most of the sRNAs had no effect. Uh, some of the SRAs, uh, sRNAs actually cause a uh, lower uh, level of uh, the luciferase, but we're interested in the ones up here that are actually um, uh, turning on sRNAs, and we took an, uh, a, a z-score of greater than two. Uh, this gave us 511 genes. So the important thing is how to figure out, out of 511 genes, which of them are, are um, uh, physiologically significant. Uh, the first um, uh, secondary screen that we did was deconvolution screen. So the Dharmacon library, and for each of the genes, it's a mixture of four different siRNAs. So essentially, it's called a deconvolution. Uh, uh, screen, you basically take each of those four and test them together. So this is 511 genes, and the consequence of that was that uh, for two, 120 of the genes, for instance, none of them, when they were individually targeted, uh, and you can see that, um, uh, for instance, only four gave four out of four, uh, 15 gave three out of four, uh, 111 gave two out of four. We found that there was a correlation between the strength of the primary hit and the number of individual complexes that scored positive in the secondary screen. And the duplexes against um, uh, 229 molecules were then carried forward uh, from this. Uh, we basically took anything that scored two or above and we selected out of the, uh, this group here um, that only had one out above those that had particularly high um, uh, uh, z-scores. Uh, What's important then is still a series of secondary screens to figure out what is physiologically significant. The initial screen was done with the BPVE2 line. We generated another cell line that expressed HPV16E2, introduced the HPV18 luciferase LCR construct into that, and redid the screen on the uh, uh, next 200, and, uh, on the 229 uh, clones. Uh, this is the cell line that we used, and again, you can see that it has a low level of uh, luciferase expression. When you knock down 16E2, now you get a release of the uh, repression. Uh, when we carry this screen out, 141 molecules were identified as demonstrating a conservation between the BPVE2 and HPVE2-mediated uh, repression. Uh, one trivial explanation for some of these genes could be these could be genes that are essentially just knocking down E2 expression, either at the transcriptional level or affecting E2 stability. Uh, so we did it in cell westerns to measure E2 protein levels, uh, and uh, this is shown here. Uh, we needed to normalize for a uh, cell number, so we stained with Alexis 680 succinimidyl ester. Uh, and then uh, do a Western uh, using an antibody to the HA and uh, epitope, which is on the BPVE2 protein. Uh, and you can see here, uh, just looking, there's some things that e in fact are being knocked down by E2. Uh, and uh, essentially look for, uh, we can then eliminate uh, things that um, uh, basically where th that turn out to be red. For instance, this is the control of an sRNA to E2. Um, uh, and when you do this, uh, one of the ones that shows up red has been the control we've been carrying all the way through, and this is the um, IL-2 receptor that I mentioned earlier. This we would expect to knock it out because it is actually target, these siRNAs are targeting the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the RNA that actually is expressing E2 since the IL-2 receptor is expressed downstream of the iris. 
Um, other ones that showed up, this is one of our positives in the screen, which is BRD4, a protein that I showed you before that we'd identified that actually uh, is involved in the tethering of E2. It's a bromodomain protein. It's a little bit of a surprise because BRD4 is actually part of PTEF-B, which is a transcriptional, it's a transcriptional activator involved in transcriptional elongation. We've, we've further, uh, so this just shows you uh, how we go from 511 through the deconvolution screen to 229 using the HPV16 E2 screen, we go to 144. Uh, we then were able to eliminate 20 that basically lowered E2 expression, and then manual examination um, uh, of the uh, following screens uh, was able to bring it down to uh, 96 hits. Uh, some of the um, uh, genes in the Dharmakine library hit just too many things to be, um, are known to hit too many things to be useful for, uh, for uh, pursuing. So this brought us down to 96 genes. Uh, and the last uh, screen we did was to basically just put the uh, LCR luciferase uh, expression clone into cells in the absence of E2 to, to determine how many of the ones that are relieving the E2 repression are actually dependent upon E2. And from this, we come up with 53 uh, genes. Then when we analyze those genes, we find that there are three major pathways that are being hit. Uh, one of these pathways is involving this transcription elongation factor, uh, PTEF-B, of which BRD4 is an example shown here. Another complex that we see is the uh, TIP60 complex, and another complex is a uh, demethylase complex that we're further working on at this point. We think these are independently contributing uh, because when we do the siRNA knockdown of, of uh, each of these in combination, we find that they're additive. Uh, and so we think they're all three are mechanistically hitting different, um, uh, different activities that are involved in this uh, E2 repression. So in conclusion, let me say that we've carried out an unbiased genome-wide siRNA screen Focused uh, and focused secondary screens have enabled us to identify 53 candidate genes. These fall, at least many of them fall into uh, pathways that en have enabled us to um, uh, identify the genes involved in E2-mediated transcriptional repression. Uh, several interesting cellular candidates that I've mentioned uh, have emerged. Ongoing is further target validation and determination of the mechanisms by which these genes contribute to the regulation of uh, papillomavirus gene expression. One of the major questions is, is what is the broader impact of these molecules on the papillomavirus life cycle? And we're particularly interested in some of the genes that have actually fallen out of the screen. For instance, those that are, in, are E2 independent and still regulate the LCR. Do, does this give us insight into genes that we might want to go after in the idea of developing therapeutics, activities that you could enhance that perhaps could downregulate the ability of uh, HPV to express in an infected cell? I'd like to give uh, thanks to the individuals in the laboratory, the postdocs and graduate students who've really done all of the work. Jansen Yu discovered BRD4 um, as being an interacting protein for E2. Um, Matthias, uh, uh, Matthias Ottinger, Michelle Ruth Schweiger, Jennifer Smith, who carried out the screen that I uh, showed, and Maria Powell, a new graduate student in the laboratory. So I'd be happy to take some questions. Good questions? Yes, Just a question. Just maybe repeat so the question. Cancer development is that where is that at right now in terms of un the understanding? I'm sorry. Of your can you repeat of, the question? Just just want to get your thought on on the understanding of perhaps assessing DNA polymorphisms such as p53 polymorphisms yeah. um, and susceptibility to either viral replication and or the development of cancer at least. Um, I think there are, uh, the question, I, I think that that's an important question that there, I don't think there's much work that has yet gone on uh, looking at viruses that are associated with cancers. With regard to the HPVs in cancers, people uh, have looked, I mean, there's some 
populations, some uh, that are more susceptible than others. Uh, people have looked at, for instance, um, um, uh, uh, HLA types and things like that to look to see if there are specific immunologic uh, um, uh, uh, factors that may be important. But I think that's really at an infancy and it'll, with, the, with the power of a lot of the genomic approaches now uh, will be important going forward. But I don't know of much data yet at that level. Peter, when uh, you, as you pointed out, there are uh, oncogenic papillomaviruses and there are non-oncogenic papillomaviruses, but both of them have E6 and E7 and both of them make uh, at least benign tumors. All of them make benign tumors in the what? So what, what are the distinctions that lead to the oncogenic viruses? So that's perhaps best studied in comparing the low risk and the high risk HPVs that I talked about. Um, uh, with regard, because they in, at least infect the same uh, epithelial cells. Um, it comes down to the E6 and E7 genes. Um, E6 for the high-risk viruses target uh, P53. Uh, E6 for the low-risk viruses do not target P53. E7 of both the high-risk and the low-risk viruses are able to engage RB, uh, but the E7 proteins of the high-risk viruses do uh, with a tenfold higher affinity than the low-risk viruses. And if you take the E7 proteins of the low-risk viruses and express them in cells, they do not induce a genotoxic uh, uh, effect. Uh, so it, it comes down to E6 and E7. At least part of the activities can be um, uh, attributed to the way they deal with P53 or don't deal with P53 and RB, but no doubt there are going to be other activities. With regard to E6, one of those important other activities is the ability to engage a family of PDZ domain containing proteins. At the end of the high risk E6 proteins, there is a domain, about a six or seven amino acid domain, that's only present in the high risk viruses. And these bind PDZ domain proteins, and through E6AP, they actually degrade these, um, these uh, proteins, and that's not an activity of the low-risk viruses. So. Yes. Yes, I have a question about the screening approach. You would think that in a system like this where you are looking for escape of a repressive signal, you have positive selection, you could potentially use um, that for pooled screening approaches. Have you had any success in that area? Is there a complication with using lentivirus in this context? Um, the pool screen, an SH uh, a screen, we started this before the, those, uh, those uh, uh, retrovirus uh, uh, libraries were as robust as they are today. We're actually doing, in collaboration with Steve Elledge's laboratory, another screen, which is a pool screen, specifically to identify the cellular genes that are involved in the regulation of the E6, E6AP dependent degradation of P53 using a very similar approach. But you're absolutely right, this would be amenable to that. Um, as best we understand, the E6 protein doesn't function normally in cells to degrade P53, yet it binds to it rather specifically. Do you know? No, it, oh, it doesn't. No, the binding of E6 to P53 is mediated by E6AP. No, but I know that, that, that's what I meant. Was yeah. E6AP binds? Yes. But it doesn't usually degrade P53 right. in cells. So, uh, what does it do? I mean, I know it's involved in Angelman syndrome yeah. and it's a ubiquitin ligase. Yeah but it doesn't seem to be involved in P53 ubiquitination. Yeah. yeah, it's not involved in P53, and, w and, and what, the what the virus is doing through E6 is essentially commandeering a normal cellular protein and redirecting it to P53. What it's d some cellular targets have been identified for E6AP, um, uh, 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 including uh, 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 several uh, tyrosine kinases when they're activated. Are, are degraded normally by E6AP. Uh, and, uh, and again, there are a number of laboratories that are further studying what those normal substrates are. Okay, one more question, yeah. Peter, there's a small subset of human head and neck cancers that are linked to papillomavirus, the ones that are thought to arise from tonsillar epithelium. Are those also in the high-risk groups, and is everything that you said about cervical cancer apply at the molecular level to those, or is there something distinctive about that situation? So, 
About 20 percent, and I should have mentioned that, about 20 percent of upper airway cancers are associated with the high-risk HPVs that are uh, the, uh, the same type. HPV-16 in particular is associated with the uh, tonsillar cancers. Um, it, uh, the data that I've looked at in, in the literature would suggest that it is through the same mechanisms of uh, E6 and E7 that are contributing there. Uh, but I don't think um, I, I think people are just beginning to study them and, and uh, to really validate those um, th those thoughts. Thank you.